Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and by now you've probably heard that uh, veteran astronaut John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, has died at the age of 95. And so, in Kerbal Space Program, I'm going to recreate his mission of Mercury Atlas 6. There had been two previous Mercury missions with crew carrying them on suborbital hops, but they upgraded to the Atlas booster, and this was supposed to bring him into orbit and around the world for three orbits. It launched on February 20th, 1962, and it made him the third of the Mercury astronauts to go to space and the fifth astronaut to go to space overall. Now, the Atlas launch vehicle was originally intended as an ICBM. It would launch nuclear missiles, but it has a really interesting design here. So the first stage uh, has three engines off them, two large booster engines. These are uh, LR-89s, and on the middle, in the middle, you had an LR-105 sustainer engine. So these would all pull off of a single large tank, a tank which was kept rigid by pressure. If it did, wasn't kept pressurized, it literally couldn't sustain its own weight. There was also a pair of LR-101 Vernier engines on the side. These provided extra roll control. Anyway, what's rather unique about this design is that the two side engines, the heavy boosters, those detach after uh, about 2 minutes and 10 seconds. Now, they don't detach with excess empty fuel tanks or anything. It's just the engines, the turbo pumps, and a bit of superstructure at the back that detaches. Now obviously this saves a chunk of mass, but also it ensures that the end of the flight, the orbital uh, circularization and everything, is carried out only by the engine with the highest specific impulse in vacuum. On the Mercury missions, there was no second stage. That was it, so the entire booster tank actually went into orbit. Anyway, the development of Mercury Atlas had been a little troubled, and as you can guess, this was the sixth mission. The fifth one, incidentally, carried a chimp called Enos. Everyone remembers Ham. A lot of people forget that Enos orbited the Earth. And of course, in real life, this launch process was essentially entirely automated. While there were controls inside the capsule, uh, and controls, I gotta point out, that John Glenn contributed to in their design. You couldn't control the launch, but you could do things like activate the tower jettison at the appropriate time. Anyway, like all of the Mercury 7, John Glenn was a test pilot, and he started his flying career uh, during World War II. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, he quit college and signed up with the US Army Air Corps, but he was never called to duty and then in, uh, transferred over to the Navy aviation units. Uh, you know, he, he trained, he flew cargo planes, and eventually he transferred to uh, F-4 Corsairs. He flew a bunch of com combat missions in the South Pacific, saw action all over the place, and then uh, continued to fly after the war. During the Korean War, he would fly an F-9 Panther jet interceptor. He flew that on 63 missions, and according to Wikipedia, he acquired the nickname Magnet Ass for his alleged ability to attract enemy flak. And I will point out that having a magnetic butt can be very useful if you're trying to sit down in zero G. Again, according to Wikipedia, on two occasions he returned to his base with over 250 holes in his aircraft. Later, he transferred to flying F-86 Sabres, shooting down MiG-15s as well. And uh, after the war, he returned and became a test pilot. He became the first person to achieve a supersonic transcontinental crossing of the United States. Project Bullet. He was uh, able to maintain greater than the speed of sound on average, despite having to slow down to refuel at least three times during this uh, crossing. Not only did he get his fifth distinguished flying cross for this, but it brought him to the attention of the public at large, and therefore put him on that very short list of astronaut candidates. In 1959, he became one of the Mercury 7, alongside Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, Wally Shearer, Gordo Cooper, Deke Slayton, and Scott Carpenter. And three years later, he was riding on top of an Atlas rocket inside Friendship 7. 
which is of course what I'm trying to do here. The difference is that I actually more or less have direct control over this thing and I think I shallowed my launch trajectory just a little so I'm trying to compensate right at the end here to make sure I uh, zero out my vertical speed just as I get into orbit. I'm going to be clear, I didn't actually uh, figure out the exact launch time and azimuth or anything. I'm just trying to get something approximately right here. I do know that the perigee was 149 and the apogee was 248. So let's see how close I can get things. Remember, I don't really have any way to trim the orbit after an engine shutdown. I have one go to basically cut the power and that's it. I think though, judging by my Delta V stats, I'm actually going to have more Delta V than the real Atlas V. I built this using uh, realism overhaul, so these engines are supposed to be correct. The structure is supposed to be the same. I'm using balloon tanks. I think pretty much everything is supposed to be the same, although I suspect the payload mass isn't quite the same, and uh, there's the superstructure on the back is completely different. I did go looking to find a picture of it, but I could not replicate the design in Kerbal Space Program. Anyway, getting very, very close, I think we're just going to try and cut the power at exactly the right moment and see if I can get into a 150 by 250 orbit. Three, two, watch it, going positive, and cut! And okay, 300 by 141, so um, I'm in orbit, I should stay up here for four orbits, or three orbits, but I don't think I'm uh, quite as accurate. I guess another thing that happened was I accidentally messed up my staging and ditched the fairing surrounding that, uh, in that interstage there. Anyway, John Glenn spent three orbits in space. That would be uh, four and a half hours before he began preparations for re-entry. And this was his only Mercury flight, and he retired in NASA in 1964 to get into politics at the suggestion of uh, one of the Kennedys. I believe it was Robert Kennedy who thought he'd make a greater uh, politician, I guess. He didn't immediately find success. He, uh, he actually hit his head and apparently dropped out of the original race, and eventually he became a senator, and at one point he was a candidate not just for vice president, but later he was a candidate for president. Around about the same time as The Right Stuff was in theatres. But he ended up losing out to more experienced and, well, more boring candidates. But in October 1998, he returned to space on board STS-95. He became the oldest person to fly in space at the ripe old age of 77, and still as a US senator. Sure, some people thought this was a bit of a publicity stunt, but you know what, if you're going to indulge some old man's dreams, it might as well be John Glenn. I mean, he was a true American hero. Anyway, back in 1962, John Glenn on Friendship 7 demonstrated that he could control the vehicle in space and he could see all sorts of things that had never really been observed before. He saw weather patterns, he saw dust storms, he saw lightning over the Indian Ocean and he also saw some mysterious fireflies were related to, probably related to outgassing from reaction control jets. But while he was admiring the scenery, there were some concerns back at Mission Control. They were getting a warning sensor triggering on Segment 51. If this sensor reading was to be believed, it would imply that the heat shield and landing bag were not secured to the spacecraft anymore. Perhaps they were only held in place by the straps holding the retro rocket in position. Now, they didn't immediately tell John about this potential problem, but they did ask him enough that he figured out what the potential issue was. He noted that there was no sound of banging as he was rotating the spacecraft, but ultimately Mission Control decided that instead of jettisoning the retro rocket after uh, firing it, they would keep it in place and hope that if the heat shield really was loose, that the straps would hold it on long enough for him to descend through the atmosphere safely. The Mercury spacecraft retroburn was supposed to be initiated at a 34 degree down attitude. 
The retro pack itself consists of three solid rocket motors which would fire for 10 seconds each. They would fire each of these five seconds apart and that would shed enough velocity for it to descend back through the atmosphere at, uh, well, relatively quickly. However, this particular retro pack seems to be way more capable than the one that was attached to the Friendship 7. This is not from the same mod, so I think it over it was overpowered, overcapable, or fired for longer or something, so I decided that I'd better flatten out my attitude a little just to avoid burning up in the atmosphere. Yeah, I know, I wimped out at the last minute. Didn't want to kill John Glenn again, that would be really, really bad PR. You'll also notice in my case, I completely messed this up because my launch azimuth was incorrect and I should have been re-entering over the Atlantic, but instead I re-entered over the Pacific. Also, yeah, I jettisoned the re I jettisoned the retro pack instead of keeping it attached like I was supposed to. So, sorry about those who wanted some historical accuracy here. If I really wanted historical accuracy, I would figure out how to get the Mercury pack running on Orbiter, but that wasn't to be. Anyway, the passing of John Glenn marks the last of the original Mercury 7, and I guess the end of the story for those early American space heroes. But while the Mercury 7 have passed into history, they still remain as inspirations for future generations of astronauts. Back then, going into space really was going into the unknown. To many, it may seem that spaceflight today is almost routine, but in the coming decades, I don't doubt that there will be humans once again pushing the limits of space exploration. And they'll all owe some small debt to the Mercury 7 and John Glenn. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Thank <laughs> you.